My guest today is Mark Irvin of Green Grow Biologicals. He joins me to share his passion for terra preta soil and biochar and how he turned that love into an entrepreneurial business, bringing a regenerative product to market. Along the way, he shares the difference between simply burning something and calling it biochar versus creating a carbon-rich, mineralized biochar, the importance of nutrient ratios for sustainable growing, and much more. Whether you're growing in your backyard, making your own biochar, or have a permaculture solution to offer the world, enjoy this conversation with Mark, and I'll join you again after. I studied at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I was in archaeology, and I kind of fell in love with archaeology of agriculture. A lot of my family members, but one prominently, studied like ancient Native American cultures on the Western United States. And I kind of enjoyed that at first. And then I started going further south, Central America and South America, and and really falling in love with some of the cultures there, like the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Inca, the Olmecs. And, you know, what for some reason caught my fascination was like the epiphany that like, wow, these were really modern, ancient cities that had 50 to 100,000, sometimes even more inhabitants. And that's a really tough thing to organize, right? Because you have to produce agriculture and food and grains for that many people. You can't just do it at a whim and just throw some seeds in a field. You have to have a whole plan and fertilizer implements. And I mean, so many different steps, of course. And so that really caught my fascination. So I dove deep into what would these cultures use for amendments and fertilizer and what helped them grow crops, you know, and what were their practices and why were they able to able to use the ground regeneratively over generations, a thousand years, and we're not able to do that in our country right now. That's what got my brain spinning. And I thought rather than try to reinvent the wheel, I was like, I just need to look back at what these ancient cultures were doing and dive in deep and look at their soil and do soil analysis and, and talk to people and read their oral history. And, you know, that's where I stumbled upon Terra Preta and what the ancients were doing for soil preparation. So that's what really got me started on my path of wanting to create a company that had ancient agricultural techniques and ancient agricultural preparations as the foundation of where we started, because I truly believe in regenerative agriculture and that we need to solve the world food crisis over the next 10 to 15 years. And we're going to do that through modern technology that's implementing ancient agricultural practices and microbiology in the soil. And that Black Earth of South America is something that I've been familiar with for some time, having attended a biochar workshop a number of years ago. And then through the work of permaculturist Albert Bates has written some about the impacts that biochar and creating these kinds of soil layers can have on our ability not only to sink carbon to combat climate change, but also to help secure nutrients in the soil so that as our climate gets stranger and weirder, some places that were dry get wetter, places that were wet get drier that many of those nutrients can be captured by that carbon and the microbiology that we're able to develop there and store it not only for our use here in the near future, but also for future generations. And where I wanted to talk with you today is that there are a lot of DIY solutions for people who want to create this if they're in the right environment to do so. When I was on the land, you know, I had my crucible and retort that I could use yard waste and turn that into biochar by burning other yard waste so that I was creating a functionally carbon neutral process. But now that I live in a city, I can't do that anymore. Or some of the other products that I might have been able to develop through composting and leaf litter and some of those other resources just aren't options anymore. And so for myself and other folks who don't have that available to us or who are looking to develop different solutions, I wanted to speak with you to hear about what 
your research and work has led to and what you're seeing come from that so that people have alternatives if they're not able to use that DIY approach? Yeah. I mean, what what I had to do is I had to say, okay, we can't take this really beautiful Terra Preta from Central and South America. I mean, and a lot of it that I study was in South America and around the Amazonian basin. So we're like, oh, how do we make this in the United States? And then how do we make that into a repeatable, manufacturable, and sellable format? Because I mean, that's that's huge for nowadays, all right? I, I have to take this product and I have to get it into your hands wherever you are in the United States and have you be able to use it successfully, whether you're in a backyard garden, whether you have a rooftop garden or a terrace garden. So what I discovered was, okay, a lot of people were trying to get into biochar at the same time as me. And I saw it as biochar is like a tool in the tool belt, right? You can't just use a hammer to build a house. You also need a saw, you need, you know, tape measure, screwdriver. I mean, you know, many other things, right? So I figured, okay, we need to take the biochar. We need to imbue it with microbial populations that would be normally found in a really thriving soil. And then we need to add other ingredients that would normally be in this terra preta. Very nice mineralization. Mineral balancing is one of the keys besides carbon, right, and microbes. Mineral balancing is so important to a healthy soil. Most people don't realize that you can throw all the fertilizer you want at something, but if the minerals aren't in balance in your soil, the microbes aren't in balance in your soil, then your soil is not going to allow that fertilizer to be taken up by the plant. So we were like, okay, let's make this product. And this is me saying this to myself. Okay, I'm, I'm going to ferment the biochar and I'm going to use microbes at my disposal. And then I'm also going to use premium worm castings. And then we're going to use a really, really high-end glacial rock and like basalt rock to get really nice mineral balancing. And then soybean meal, right? Because all these things are so crucial. If you're at home, if you're in a rooftop garden, you don't have access to all these different things, all these different components. This needs to be simple, repeatable for people around the world to be successful at growing their own food and also regenerating the soil. So in my opinion, I was like, okay, I need to make this a concentrated product. So through my manufacturing process that I developed, I basically was distilling down the terra preta that I found in South America into a more concentrated format so that you could get it in a bag. And if you have a terrace garden or a rooftop garden or like an indoor garden, you could take a spoonful of this material and mix it into, you know, a one gallon, a five gallon, a 10 gallon pot and have the regenerative effects that the ancients knew would happen when they tilled into their fields. So I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big ask. And what you speak to about plant uptake, I've had some conversations on the show about nutrient-dense food and making sure that we have things like the rock minerals that you mentioned. The way you just spoke about that, though, makes me think that an analogy for it is like when we're trying to get complete proteins and that if we don't have all the right balance of amino acids, then we, we can't create a complete protein. Absolutely. It's a perfect definition. And that this is looking to create, I almost think of it as then that what you're putting together is almost like a vitamin for our plants, though not as a fertilizer, but as a supplement to provide support for them. And we can look at it in a way like this too, for people that are just diving into like soil rejuvenation or like soil carbon webs and things like that. So we're basically doing a yogurt for plants, but a mineral balanced yogurt for plants. You know, like imagine having a yogurt with active cultures in it, proteins, amino acids, and then you're adding minerals to it. And so there's 102 minerals that plants and humans can potentially absorb. And a lot of them you only need in trace amounts. So what we need to do is balance those minerals in the soil with proteins, with amino acids, with carbon and the carbon matrices have to be activated so that it can hold those 
minerals and hold the microbes and create a housing unit for them. If that if that's a better description for people in their mind of like what biochar does for the soil. Originally in this section, I was trying to recall how much surface area there was in a gram of biochar, but couldn't remember in the moment. So I looked it up after the interview with Mark, and depending on how biochar is created, a single gram can have anywhere from tens to hundreds of square meters of surface area for nutrients and microbes to cling to. Yeah, and I mean, and, and that's like why I feel like carbon-rich soils are more important than people think about at first glance because it's not just, you know, we're made of carbon, plants are made of carbon, we need carbon in the soil. It's that this carbon cycle that happens in the soil, like this carbon vehicle in the soil is providing multiple modalities of effects in the soil, to the plant, et cetera. And what I like to always point out to people, and this is for people that are just getting into biochar and terra soils and stuff, is that you have to properly treat the biochar. This is literally what I've discovered by not only reading, but studying the Native Americans in Central and South America was that they knew something that we still are barely grasping right now, which was like by fermenting the biochar and activating it in a, in a specific way, you are preventing the carbon from leaching the nitrogen, which is important. That's a hugely important aspect. The carbon to nitrogen ratio in a soil dictates whether your plants are going to grow or not grow. To me, that was fascinating. And to this day, we're still having issues with people that, you know, produce soils or fertilizers and things like that. And they don't, they don't even know that if you don't have a C to N ratio that's correct, your nitrogen will consistently be robbed by the carbon in your soil. A lot of the biochars that are out in the public right now that people are peddling, to me, it shows that if I look at it and they're just basic biochars, to me, it shows that either the person selling the biochar doesn't understand what they're selling or the company is just trying to sell a byproduct of another industry that they're trying to get rid of. And to me, it's really important for every listener to know that, you know, do your research and understand how to use these tools because they are tools. And if you use them incorrectly, you will think that you curse the ground that you were growing on. And that was one of my experiences from the DIY approach of using biochar was running across some articles that talked about the need to charge them with nutrients and life before I use them. In my case, I was using, I had a, a bucket that I would fill with water and then toss a couple handfuls of worm castings, some of my finished compost in, and then my chunks of biochar, and I would just let them bubble away in there for a day or two. I would use that liquid then in my garden, pull off the biochar, and then grind that down to use with my potted plants. And that's an approach, and I would say an approach that maybe some people are doing in other areas where it's close. It's very close to the way it needs to be done. Because one thing we need to do is we have to wash away the ash, right? The ash content is what can cause havoc, you know, in not only the pH of the soil, but also with how plants thrive in that soil. And what you did was you washed away the ash, which is important. A lot of people that I see online that I talk to are like using, you know, tree clippings and things like that and wood chips and they're, they have a backyard barbecue going on basically. And then they just dump that fire remnants into their soil and say, I just made biochar for cheap. And, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a good thing. When we are having these conversations about rich black earth, that product is not it. Biochar is something more specific that is created in a controlled way and then processed for use. And that historically, it was done in a particular way across large areas, but now we're looking at doing it in a controlled fashion. Yes, we can use those yard trimmings and cast offs, but they still have to be processed in a particular way if someone wants to do it in a DIY fashion. But then what you are doing as an entrepreneur is bringing that to the marketplace so that people don't have to. Yeah. I mean, and I think 
an all-in-one approach sometimes is better for the modern gardener or the modern consumer because what these Native Americans were doing is they were using what they had on hand. And what they had on hand, their trash piles were compost piles because they didn't have things that didn't biodegrade. So they would take their trash piles from their encampments or from their areas, and they would mix that with the trees and shrubs that they had either cleared for the field, which happened to be hardwood down there in the Amazonian basin. And they had rich mineral dense soil because they were in the Amazonian basin, you know, and they would take those stalks and the remnants of that crop and they would mix that together with their compost and then eventually with their biochar. And then there's still some things I don't know that they did, you know, but, and then they would mix that and till that into their fields and then wait six months for the magic to happen because that was their way of going, thinking ahead, planning ahead. So when I talk to a lot of farmers and growers and people that are trying to maybe even do rooftop gardens, I'm like, hey, let's plan a little ahead. If your soil is tired and worn out and old, let's try in November and December before the rains come to mix some of these types of terra preta amendments into your soil and let the rain activate it and let it do its thing over the next few months because that's the true way that the ancients use this. And I think it's the most effective way. And that provides the opportunity then through something like what you're making by working that in at the end of the growing season and having those months in between that the rain falls and carries the dust and other materials down with it. It allows the microbial and fungal life to inhabit those spaces. And then also for like the cation exchange to occur in order for the biochar to take up those nutrients and hold them near the surface for those shallow rooted plants. And there's another interesting benefit is in the terra preta and especially the product that we manufacture is that there's saprocytic microorganisms, right? And that's pretty much digesters. Let's just call them digesters. They're dead organic matter digesters. And so what people will do is they'll mix it into their soil or at least the top few layers of soil. And those digesters will decompose all the root balls, their, you know, any dead organic matter leaves, sticks, twigs in that soil and put those nutrients back into the soil that were trapped in those you know, roots or twigs or leaves. And I find that interesting because sometimes people are like, oh man, I don't want to reuse this soil. Or I don't want to reuse this pot because there's a stump with some roots in it from a tomato plant or from this plant. Okay, let's digest that back into the soil like we're supposed to. And so that is something that I think is useful about terra preta is that the, the ability to digest dead organic matter with the microbe content that's inside of it. And that really saves people because then they don't have to think about it. They just harvest when they harvest, apply the terra preta, let the magic work over the next few months. And then by the time they come to till their garden again or start their garden, there's nothing left of the dead organic matter. And this is where I love these solutions, especially as we're in this period of transition. We may have an ideal that we would like to live in or be working towards when it comes through these hyper-localized DIY solutions. But as you spoke to earlier, as we're in the world that exists now, living the lives that we have, we don't always have time to be able to make these solutions on our own. Or we don't necessarily, as I pointed to, have the space or the resources to do so, because I know my apartment complex would be real angry with me if I rolled out a retort and just started making biochar next to the swimming pool. I think also for our health, when you're dealing with soil microbes, you're dealing with the good and the bad. There's no magical spell you can say, hey, all the bad microbes go away and I just want the good ones. So knowing how to properly cultivate the microbes is a science and you can learn it but in most cases, it's better to let it be done by a professional or you could risk adding a pathogen to your soil that you weren't intending to. Something I've been thinking through throughout our entire conversation today is that I am fortunate enough that I spend every day practicing permaculture. I am always thinking about this and working on it. And yet, the amount that I actually know and would consider myself an expert on is such a small piece. And though I encourage everyone who would be interested 
in doing so to find something that they love and are passionate about and get really good at it. For all of these other pieces, there are folks such as yourself who are acting in the world to create what we need to build that beautiful future that we want now in the world as it exists. And I take a lot of hope knowing that, you know, this is the decade where we really need to get deep on a lot of these issues when looking at the work coming from like the IPCC documents that the best time for us to have done this would have been decades ago. But the 2020s are the decade where we really need to give this the best shot that we can with all the tools and resources that are available. And I'm thankful for you and the other folks who are innovating on so many of these ideas, giving credit to the peoples where they come from and helping to provide the tools and resources that we need right now. People need to understand that the way we've done things for the last 50 years through chemical fertilizers was to get us, I guess, more industrialized, which sure it worked, but at a cost of the next 50 to 100 years being really challenging for our grandchildren and great grandchildren. So I think if we can really just kind of step in and take some of this modern technology and science and bond it with ancient agricultural techniques and practices, that would be probably the most elegant solution to the next 50 years of world agriculture. For those folks who would like to learn more about you, the research that you've done, your work, and the products you're producing, where can they find you? Green Grow Biologicals is the name of the company. The Green Grow with no W dot com. So the Green Grow dot com. And then we do an Instagram at the Green Grow and a YouTube channel called Green Grow Biologicals LLC. And YouTube will dive in a little bit deeper on things. And then Instagram is more just small nurturing, you know, videos and how to videos. And in the few minutes that we have remaining, do you have any final thoughts for the listeners? I would say that people need to treat their soil as a living body. So just like our planet is kind of in and of itself a living organism, right? Almost you can imagine it breathing and having its own diverse ecosystems all over the planet. The soil is a sea. It's a sea that carries hundreds of billions of microbes and different species of microbes and and minerals and different types of things that we need to sustain life on this planet. If the soils get depleted, if we don't continue to regenerate our soils, we will have smaller and smaller area worldwide to produce agriculture on, which means our planet will, will allow for a lower and lower carrying capacity. So I think it's our duty and our job over the next 20 years to solve the world food crisis and solve our agricultural practices for a better tomorrow. And that was Mark Irvin. You'll find a link to thegreengrow.com and the social media Mark mentioned in the resource section of the show notes. If you're interested in cannabis, you'll definitely want to check out the Green Grow Instagram. In the resource section of the show notes, you'll also find links to articles and books about Terra Preta and biochar, along with past episodes of the podcast related to nutrient density and soil building. Leaving this conversation, are there any other entrepreneurs that come to mind doing amazing work offering permaculture or permaculture-related solutions? Let me know by leaving a comment in the show notes, sending me a direct message if you're a patron, or by visiting thepermaculturepodcast.com and clicking on Contact. While you're there, check out the extensive archives stretching back more than a decade. Until the next time, spend each day giving back to the world while taking care of Earth, yourself, and each other.